नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स सो वी आर इनटू लेक्चर 17 इन आवर कोर्स ऑन प्रोडक्ट डिजाइन एंड डेवलपमेंट एंड इन वीक फोर्थ और द लास्ट वीक वी आर डिस्कसिंग द डिजाइन फॉर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग गाइडलाइंस डिजाइन फॉर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग एंड असेंबली गाइडलाइंस एंड वी आर सीइंग दैट एज अ प्रोडक्ट डिजाइनर व्हाट आर द वेरियस गाइडलाइंस दैट वी शुड नो और एटलीस्ट वी शुड हैव एन आइडिया फॉर प्रोडक्ट्स दैट आर गोइंग टू बी मैन्युफैक्चर्ड एट अ लेटर स्टेज नाउ if you remember we are learning different tools and techniques for product design so maybe if we can divide three stages of product development process or product design and development process initial is conceptualization and the concept design then the detailed design then the prototyping and finally the manufacturing so we will not be going to actual manufacturing of the product but our focus will be limited to the first two stages that is the product design and then the prototyping of the product so in this week our focus will be on the guidelines that should be taken into account when we have a detailed design is ready or we are in the process of doing the detailed design so initially we will have a concept and that concept we will develop into the detailed design with all specifications tolerances uh, settings whatever has to be given for the product design or the detailed design but as we have seen in the last class there are certain guidelines that we need to follow in lecture 1 if you remember last class we have seen what are the dfma guidelines by two different authors we have seen that what are the generic guidelines for products when they have to be manufactured so that they are easy to manufacture as well as they are easy to assemble so we have seen dfma guidelines in the last class today we are going to cover the product design guidelines for manual assembly now suppose the product has to be assembled manually there can be two methods of the assembly one can be a manual assembly another can be a automatic assembly so the product design has to be facilitated or has to be uh, analyzed from these guidelines point of view that when the product will be assembled whether the assembly operations would be easy or the assembly operations would be cumbersome or troublesome or difficult so we will see that what are the guidelines to be taken into account for products which are specifically going to be assembled using manual assembly so in automatic assembly yes we can have a automatic system and which can fairly deal with complicated products also or the assembly operations can be little bit complicated but when the manual assembly has to be done a man is going to perform the assembly operations we have to see that what are the features that we should incorporate into our product design so that the manual assembly becomes easy or it becomes easier for the person or the worker who is working on the shop floor to easily assemble the different parts together so what are these guidelines what are the problems problems that we usually see when the workers try to assemble the various parts together and what are the things that we should keep in mind rules of thumb which should help us in the design of the product in such a way that the worker is easily able to assemble the product so let us see the guidelines now the general guidelines for manual assembly means these are the product design guidelines that we should keep in mind the process of manual assembly can be divided into two separate areas now when a person is going to assemble two parts together what are the two important things he do he does during that operation first is handling so first he will acquire the job he will lift the job or he will just take the product or the component from the bin or the component from the bin and then that is that particular section of his work can be classified as handling so first is taking the job taking the component so handling can include acquiring orienting and moving the parts so first thing is he has to acquire the part sometimes he may have to move the part suppose he is taking up nut from this bolt so sorry nut from this Uh, box bolt from this box then he is moving them together and just putting them at place so that can be orienting so he is orienting the two parts together so he is taking nut from 
one box bolt from another box and bringing them together so that will fall under the first category that is handling second is insertion and fastening then the second stage is he will insert the nut the bolt into the nut and start the fastening operation so that is insertion and fastening mating a part to another part or a group of parts so in manual assembly these are the two fundamental basic motions or functions that a worker is going to do he is going to take the two individual components that have to be assembled manually and then he is going to assemble them sometimes in the assembly operations it may so happen that there may be a bigger structure or a bigger product and a smaller component has to be assembled on top of this bigger component so that will also fall under the manual assembly part only and we will see very briefly that what are the various types of assembly stations or assembly operations so first thing to understand is manual assembly manual assembly means handling and insertion and fastening taking the part and bringing the two parts together and then doing the fastening operation now let us see what are the general design guidelines for manual assembly so we these are uh, the design guidelines for part handling now we have seen in the previous slide there are handling operations there are insertion and fastening operations so let us see for the first part that is handling what are the design guidelines when the product has to be handled manually and it has to be fastened to another part what are the things that we should keep in mind first thing is design the parts that have end to end symmetry and rotational symmetry about the axis of insertion so here we can see two examples are shown this is a symmetrical part so easy to handle so if the, uh, there is a symmetry in the part it becomes easy to handle if this cannot be achieved try to design parts having the maximum possible symmetry so this is also asymmetrical but still it is symmetric about the horizontal axis and there is maybe a chamfered portion on the other side so first thing that we should keep in mind is that we should try to design the product if possible as much symmetric as possible if it is not possible to have all axis of symmetry we should go for uh, maximum possible symmetry that can be incorporated into the product this is uh, another feature you can see provide features that will prevent jamming of parts that tend to nest or stack when stored in bulk if you remember in case of steel glasses sometimes you will see they will stick one inside the other and it is very difficult to bring it out so steel glasses may stick to one another so that type of feature if that type of products are there what we can do this product will definitely jam if there is another product which can fit inside this another can go then further inside this difficult to open them or separate them but if we have this additional feature here inside and this is not interfering with any functional requirement of this product so this additional feature that we are providing here if it is not interfering with any functional requirement of this product definitely we should try to incorporate this feature here because then this will not jam other part cannot go inside and sit inside very easily we can take out even if the product goes up to a particular depth we can very easily take it out so this is a one feature which can be added in order to prevent the jamming of parts and it is easy to handle the part for the assembly operation so let us see other examples for uh, part handling here we can see avoid features that will allow tangling of parts when stored in bulk so we need to avoid the features which will maybe lead to tangling of the parts and then when you are handling it it becomes difficult to take the part out other things can be we can store them in a particular uh, for this particular example if we have a rod and we put all these parts on the rod it is it becomes easier to take out one part at a time but many times we store the parts in the bulk and therefore they have the tendency to tangle into each other that thing has to be avoided so we can design the part in such a way that each even we store them in the bulk they will not tangle to each other which means we can reduce this opening here in the design so that 
no other part can easily tangle with this part. So, this can be easily done if it is not compromising with the operational requirements of this product or with the functional requirements of this product. Definitely, we can reduce this opening so that we can avoid the tangling of the parts. Let us see some other examples. Now, we should avoid the parts, some specific parts, there are some guidelines related to handling that we should avoid. First thing is, we should avoid parts that stick together or are slippery, delicate, flexible or very small. So, here you can see this is a very small part, even with our fingers we are not able, we may not be able to lift it. So, for manual assembly there may be requirement of a tong, very small tong or some assistive device for lifting this part. So, we can avoid if possible we can increase the size, if not possible then an assistive device has to be provided to the worker so that he can lift the, this part easily. So, we should avoid the parts, there are 3, 4 things mentioned here which is slippery in nature number one which is delicate in nature which is flexible means difficult to handle or which is very very small also we should avoid the parts which are very large in size difficult by to handle them by hand so that those type of parts should also be avoided also we should avoid the hazardous to handle parts such such type of parts which are hazardous to the handler which type what are the examples parts that are sharp splinter easily all those parts should be avoided so this is here you can see a pin on one side it is very very sharp so this sharp part should be avoided such type of flexible parts should also be avoided so when we are handling a particular component we should take care that if possible we should not make it very very small we should not make it very large it should not have sharp edges all those parts should be avoided because it will be difficult for the manual worker or the uh, person doing this manual assembly to handle it properly. Now, first part we have seen that there are two parts in manual assembly. First part is the handling part, another part is the mating part or the insertion or fastening or the actual operation that is done. So, when we are designing a product, we should see that we design the part in such a way or design the component in such a way that it is easy to assemble by insertion and fastening. So, let us see what are the design guidelines that we should take into account for the product which has to be assembled, design so that there is little or no resistance to insertion and provide chamfers to guide insertion of two mating parts. So, here we can see parts jam across the corners. So, we have to provide the chamfers to guide insertion of two mating parts. So, if we provide chamfers here, maybe it may become slightly easier for this part to go and, and settle down there and we should provide the part so that it offers little or no resistance to insertion and chamfers to guide. So, we have to give proper clearance here so that this part can directly go inside and fix or set at its designated place. So, chamfers and minimum resistance to the motion of this part. Then generous clearance should be provided, but care must be taken to avoid clearances that will result in a tendency for parts to jam or hang up during insertion. So, there is an optimal level or optimum value of the clearance that should be provided between the two mating parts, so that they fix properly. If it is more more clearance is given, still it will lead to problem. And if there is no clearance given, then it will become a press type of fit. Maybe it, we may have to apply force to force fit the two parts together. That is also not desirable. So, we have to provide this optimal clearance so that the two parts fit together properly. So, this is the design guidelines for insertion and fastening. This is another guideline. This is here we can see this is a blind hole, insertion is difficult, this is the part which is going inside this blind hole. So, we should what we should do? We should provide for air relief passages to improve the insertion into blind holes. Now, here it is a blind hole, we can provide this passage here this passage you can see for the release of air which is inside this blind hole. So, provision of air relief passages to improve the insertion into blind hole. So, we can see here 
this part can now easily assemble because the air inside will move out from this air relief passage. What else can be done? We can have a hole in the pin, this is the pin which is going inside the blind hole. Now, in this pin we can have a centric hole here, a central hole along the axis which is shown here and the air can just move out of this hole when this pin is moving down into the blind hole. What else can be done? We can give one chamfer or a flat on one side of the pin so that the air can come out from here. This is flat on pin. So, the we should provide the air relief so that we, it is easy to insert and the worker need not apply excessive pressure for this insertion and fastening operation. So, this is simple design guideline which can be taken care during the product design stage so that the product is assembled easily. This is another example you can see design guidelines for insertion and fastening. Again as we have discussed there are two broad categorization of the manual assembly operations the handling and the insertion and fastening. Now we are looking at design guidelines for insertion and fastening and this is another guideline for insertion and fastening. Pro provision of chamfers to allow easy insertion. So, here we can see this particular part has to be inserted in this part or component. So, here this when we try to insert it, it may stick here or may be may not facilitate the easy setting of this part inside. Here also we see there is a sharp corner. So, what can be done? We can chamfer this part. Even this part goes there, it will be guided to its direct to its designated position. If even if it goes in this direction, it is guided through through this slant or through this chamfer into the into its designated position. So, we can provide chamfers on both sides to parts so that the part falls into its place or it is guided to its designated position. So, this is a simple design guideline which can help us for assembly operations when the part will be assembled during the final manufacturing. Now, here we can see design guideline again for insertion and fastening avoid the necessity for holding parts down to maintain their orientation. So, sometimes we need to design the part in such a way that it is self oriented. Here we can see there is no position. So, this will move here and there and we have to insert ensure a certain that this particular hole or this particular feature matches with the feature in the basic or the base part or the part to which this part has to be assembled. So, this is slightly may be cumbersome process or slightly time taking process, but if we provide a slot here so that self locating feature is there directly this top part can come and fit at its designated position. It will make the work of the worker or it will make the job of the worker far more easier as compared to this thing. Only thing that we need to do here is we have to provide this recess or we can say pocket here so that this top part can come and sit here. So, we can just read this ex, uh, the uh, explanation for these figures avoid the necessity for holding parts down to maintain their orientation during manipulation of the sub assembly or during the placement of another uh, part. So, we should avoid the necessity for holding this part and then using the other hand to fasten it, it should be self locating in nature. If holding down is required, then try to design so that the part is secured as soon as possible after it has been inserted. So, we have to ensure as soon as the part is inserted into the base part in on which it has to be assembled, it should have self alignment and self we can say locating uh, uh, characteristics so that it is located and then we can do the fastening operation. So, we should not uh, have that uh, you can say requirement of holding it down until we fasten it. So, that can that type of design should be done so that it is easy to perform the assembly operation. Now, here we can see we have to design the part in such a way. Now, here you can see this pin has to be fixed here in this slot. It is difficult to do it manually. If we try to drop it down, it may take this position and this particular section may not enter into its designated point. So, part part must be released before it is located, which is not a desirable thing. So, here we have to 
release this part before it is before it is inserted here. So, part must be released before it is located. So, before location we have to release the part and then we have to wish that this particular pin will directly go there and settle at its designated place which is just probabilistic it is we cannot say deterministically that this will go and settle down here only. But if we increase this length and we locate it before releasing then we are 100 percent sure deterministically we 100 percent we know that this will definitely go and set there. Before releasing this, it is posit getting positioned here. Now, we can use a screwdriver to fasten this thing. So, this is another design guideline which should be taken into account that the part should be located at its position before we are releasing that part. So, only design change is the length of this section which is helpful in locating it before we release the part. So, it will make the job of the manual worker easy when he is performing the assembly operation and will also improve his productivity and efficiency of doing his work satisfactorily. So, here we will now go to the types of manual assembly operations. One is the bench assembly. Here we can see the bench assembly operation, a worker, this is a worker, these are the storage bin, most common type of assembly operations and here we have a fixture in which he will fix the two parts. So, he may take one part from here, another part from here and then he can assemble, put the two parts together in the fixture and perform the assembly operation. So, the, the storage bins are oriented in a semicircular fashion which are uh, standard design guidelines for for design of the workspace and are usually taught in a subject of work system design that how a workplace should be designed for a worker. So, here this is a standard practice of putting the storage bins in this fashion so that it is in the maximum and the minimum working area for a average able bodied person. So, this is a standard you can say workplace design and this is standard design for manual assembly operation also. So, this is first type of bench assembly for small parts with easy reach of worker. Then we can have a multi station assembly that the product is moving around on a conveyor belt and the people or the workers are performing their operation on that product. So, these are the storage bins for him for worker number 1. These are the storage bins for worker number 2 and there is a conveyor belt on which the product is moving and the workers can use the storage bin, take out the components which have to be assembled on this product from the storage bin and then do the manual assembly here. Then the product moves down to the next worker and the operations are done, whatever are the required operations done by the second worker on this product. So, this is second type multi station assembly operation, first one is bench assembly, second one is multi station assembly and this is for major body motion. So, maybe uh, this is the characteristics of multi station assembly. Then we have a modular assembly center you can see here in which this is a worker, this is a storage rack, these are the storage bins, auxiliary tool table, additional storage. So, maybe when the job is slightly bigger in size, we can have a modular assembly center in which the different parts or modules can be combined together finally by the worker. So, he may get different modules from different stations and the final assembly may be done on the workbench here. Then other type of assembly center can be the custom assembly center which is given here. Auxiliary table, this is the work table, lift table, this is pedestal jib crane. So, we see there are lift table, pedestal jib crane which means that custom assembly center will be used where you have assistive devices for the assembly per the person who is doing the assembly operation. Flexible assembly layout is also there, this is a person, there is a carousal tool cart, so we can bring the uh, material who which has to be assembled to the work table here, assembly work table. Then there is a handling equipment area, there are mobile storage carts, mobile storage carts means that they can move, more flexible nature of the assembly layout that is flexible assembly layout. Then we have the multiple multiple uh, or multi assembly for large products you can see one worker is working here, tool cart another worker is here all these are storage carts, multi assembly may be used for very large products. So, 
this is just to uh, give you an outline that what are the type types of uh, we can say manual assembly which is done so different types of layouts or uh, this thing are given but our focus majorly is on the design guidelines as a product designer so this particular section may not be relevant from the product design point of view but definitely relevant from the engineering point of view so that we know that when we are designing our product how it will finally be assembled it may be you it may be assembled on a bench assembly it may be assembled on a line or a conveyor belt it may be assembled as a custom assembly section it may be a modular assembly type of a product so we at least some idea we should have that when we are designing the product how the product will finally be assembled so the second part is not much relevant to the product design but is relevant from the application point of view so we have seen today that what are the two major sections or two major uh, operations during the manual assembly one is handling another one is insertion and fastening and what are the product design guidelines that we should take into account when we are handling the part or the part has to be handled and what are the design guidelines in the product that we should incorporate so that it is easy to fasten and insert and if we take care of these guidelines during the product design stage our assembly operations would be easier and when the assembly operations would be easier the productivity and efficiency as well as effectiveness of the worker will be more and when the effectiveness of the worker will be more we with the company will be able to produce more number of parts and more number of parts means that the company will be able to judiciously or efficiently utilize the resources at its disposal and that will lead to the profit of an organization so starting from the design of the product the company can be into the profit so all these guidelines should be taken into account when the product is being designed in our next session we will cover maybe the other aspects of dfma that is we will see that if the product has to be manufactured by casting process what are the guidelines to be taken into account if the product has to be manufactured by forging process what are the guidelines to be taken into account there is a long list of guidelines for casting and forging and extrusion and machining and injection molding we may not be able to cover everything in our short duration of time but we will definitely like to cover at least one or two guidelines of each of the operations so that you get an idea that such type of information is available and then you can use the various knowledge bases and resources for getting the further or the detailed information on these type of design guidelines so maybe in next lecture we will focus on design guidelines for uh, products to be manufactured by various manufacturing processes thank you